So we've basically come to the end of the material in the course, and what we have for you for the next couple of days is just starting to talk um, about kind of the bigger picture and some of the things that, uh, that you can do with all the tools that you've developed in this class. Before we get into that, uh, people are finally starting to submit to the contest, which is good. I just wanted to put up a little teaser video for Monday. So here is a match that took place that I cannot make the right size. Um, come on. Okay, so here's a match that happened online. This was between Alex Yang and Divya Ghosh. And things are looking pretty good for red. And so, in spite of a strong start from red, blue wins the end. So, uh, you too could have uh, fame and glory and the admiration of your classmates uh, if you participate in the contest. So, I think that's it for contesty things. Uh, questions about this or admin stuff or anything else before we get going? Yeah. When is the project due? Sunday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. The official, the official word is Sunday. Um, yes, and uh, regrade requests for last midterm closed today, so hopefully you got those all in. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about a couple of different applications, uh, specifically uh, natural language processing games, and hopefully we'll have time at the end to get to some, some stuff with robotic cars as well. Um, and yeah, so just to say this again, what we've been looking at in this class so far are kind of foundational methods in AI, and when we've been applying them and when we've been implementing them, they've mostly been in kind of toy worlds like, like Pac-Man or like this little uh, walking, dragging robot here. Um, and so what we're going to be interested in looking at today are instead finding kind of advanced applications um, of all of these things that we've developed. And so we're going to take what we know about uh, sort of search and pathfinding, and we're going to use that to do uh, some sort of interesting structured prediction problems using natural language. We're going to take what we know about, uh, what was this thing that I just eliminated, about reinforcement learning, for example, and use that to, uh, to figure out how to play games. And similarly for, for uh, applications in little robots and applications in really big robots that are shaped like cars. Um, so yeah, let's just dive into this. The first kind of application area that we're going to be talking about today is what's called natural language processing. Uh, and this is, in my other life as a graduate student, mostly what I, I work on. Um, what is natural language processing? So um, here's a great cartoon from Gary Larson. Uh, it's a person talking to a dog. The person says, OK, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, stay out of the garbage or else. Uh, and what the dog actually hears is blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 ginger, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the claim here is that basically dogs know how to implement grep and people know how to implement sort of general natural language processing tools. And so what we would really like uh, our computers to be able to do is to, to not be doing this grep thing that the dogs are doing, uh, but in fact to kind of understand at a much deeper level uh, what language is, how it works, and, and to be able to do things with it in the same way uh, that humans do. And it turns out this is a really hard task. Uh, to persuade you that this is a really hard task, here are some newspaper headlines. Uh, enraged cow injures farmer with axe. <laughs> Hospitals are sued by seven foot doctors. Ban on nude dancing on governor's desk. A really famous one, Iraqi head seeks arms. <laughs> Local high school dropouts cut in half. <laughs> Juvenile court to try shooting defendant. Stolen painting found by tree. Kids make nutritious snacks. Why are these funny? Ambiguity, exactly, right? For each of these sentences, there's kind of the reading. I mean, in a lot of these cases, this is just the headline writer is kind of screwing, you with, screwing with us. But, uh, you know, there's the kind of reading that is literally what's going on, right? That the farmer's holding the ax and gets injured by the cow anyway. That the, there are seven doctors who operate on feet who are suing the hospital. So there are these readings, and then there are uh, the readings that you actually get that make you laugh, that it's the cow with the ax, or that the doctors are seven feet tall, uh, or that kids are delicious. And what's interesting here is that there are a bunch of different ways in which 
um, uh, in which these are funny, right? There are kind of issues of lexical ambiguity, where what does it mean to make a nutritious snack? Does that mean to like function as a nutritious snack or to create a nutritious snack? Uh, there are, or you know, similarly, uh, when the head seeks arms, what kind of head? What kind of arms? Um, uh, and then there are grammatical ambiguities, like this ban on nude dancing on governor's desk, where what really makes this funny is that we don't know kind of what the relationship is between this little phrase on nude dancing, the, the phrase governor's desk, uh, and then the whole sentence. And depending on where you attach all of those things, you get totally different interpretations of what's going on. And so one of the tasks uh, that we're really interested in being able to solve uh, that turns out to be useful for a lot of other downstream applications in natural language processing is what's called uh, parsing. And so parsing, do we have a, a picture of this somewhere? Yeah. So parsing is the task, basically, if you remember back probably to when you were in like elementary school, um, at some point you practice diagramming sentences and, you know, drawing these little lines that say, how does this word relate to the other words? D do people still do this? How many people actually had to diagram sentences in school? Okay. Uh, only like half of you. This is probably a good thing. It's not actually a thing that people should do ever, probably. Um, but it turns out to be really useful for computers. Um, and so if you can sort of take trained linguists and make them do that a bunch of times, eventually we can get, it, uh, get the computers to do it for us instead. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to resolve uh, all of the kinds of ambiguities that come up in language. So here's a really simple one. Uh, we have three words, Hershey, bars, protest. Um, and there are two different ways of reading this, right? There are kind of, uh, there's a reading in which the Hershey bars are protesting, and there's a reading in which uh, there is a protest regarding Hershey bars. I guess I got those in the opposite direction. Um, but, you know, basically, you can represent these two different ambiguities by drawing two different kind of tree-shaped structures uh, corresponding to the underlying structures of these two sentences. Um, and in general, what we can do is we can kind of write down a grammar of natural language, and then what we can try to figure out is, uh, given a new input sentence, under that grammar, what is the correct analysis uh, of that sentence? And what makes this problem really interesting is that there's not going to be just one analysis for every sentence, but in fact there's going to be, you know, many different analyses. And so what we really need are probabilistic tools that allow us to say, these are all of the readings that are acceptable, but this is the one that... Uh, that is actually intended. This is the one that, that probably is going to be right. Um, and what's cool about this is that you can represent this parsing process uh, using kind of a combination of a bunch of different tools that we've seen in this class. So just in the same way that hidden Markov models define probability, or Markov models more generally define probability distributions over strings. Uh, and I guess the, you know, the right analogy here is the HMM analogy, right? Where you have some hidden structure along the backbone that causes you to observe a bunch of, of tokens along the bottom, whether those are kind of states of the world, or we can think of them in this case uh, as words in your language. We can similarly define a probabilistic grammar that's going to have some kind of hidden structure that ultimately generates the words that we have in the sentence in the order that we saw them. And just in the same way that we wanted to kind of solve this inverse problem and figure out what the hidden states were in our HMM, we can say in one of these tree-shaped structures what was the hidden tree structure that gave rise uh, to the sequence of words that we saw. So we write down a, a probabilistic model that looks like uh, kind of like a hidden Markov model, but a tree-shaped hidden Markov model rather than a chain-shaped one. Uh, and we're doing some kind of probabilistic inference but it turns out that uh, the easiest way of doing that probabilistic inference, you know, there are, um, there's an equivalent of the forward, and the forward algorithm that you saw in class for doing parsing. Um, but uh, generally, the number of parse trees is so large that even that is not going to be efficient. And so what we do instead is we treat this as a search problem. What's the state space for this search problem going to look like? Okay, important thing that you should remember before the final in this class. When we say, what does the state space look like? We don't want to just know how big it is, but actually like what you're writing down. So why did you come up with that number? Uh, well, uh, it, it would be the number of words, because obviously you need to know how many words are in the sentence. Mm -hmm. um, but are the words going to change? Uh, based on how they were used, presumably. I, I guess, so... To make this more concrete, right, we have a search problem that says, that looks like, I'm giving you Hershey bars protest. 
That's fixed. And what I want to write on top of this is, you know, what's the what's the right analysis of this? Is this, uh, yeah, kind of which of these two things we've drawn up top? So this isn't changing over the course of the search process, right? The thing that we're trying to discover is just the tree structure here. Yeah. Rules, sure. Okay, so what would that look like? Okay, sure. Okay, so we're putting some kind of tags on these things. Uh, but that's not a tree, right? That's just... So where do the trees go? Yeah. You go to the root of the sentence. Okay, and what do we do with the root of the sentence? Okay, but if we know that ahead of time, then there's no search problem, right? So we want, we're trying to build up a whole tree structure. So what are our intermediate search states going to look like? Yeah. So how's that? Like, what are what goes in a state, and what are my operations for moving to the next state? Okay. So, but like, if I want to write down a state of this, what am I writing down? Okay. So we might be able to assign tags to individual words. We might also want to assign labels to whole chunks of the sentence that look like this. And so we can think of what we're doing here as basically building up a bunch of little trees. And so we're going to start with little fragments of trees. And as we go along here, we're going to have rules that say, uh, you know, you're allowed to put these two trees together. Or you're not allowed to put these two trees together according to the rules of the grammar. Uh, and you're going to keep kind of tagging things or combining pieces of things all the way until you get up to the top of the sentence. And again, you know, you know what the top of the sentence is supposed to look like. And that's how you realize you've reached the goal state when you have a tree analysis that covers all of the words. Yeah. The state space is a bunch of trees. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe it turns out to be a little more complicated than this, but you can think of it as little sets of trees, essentially. Right. And so what are the weights along our edges? They're the probabilities of these rules under our grammar. And so what we're trying to do when we do the search process ultimately is recover the most probable um, uh, derivation because that's going to correspond to the highest, the path of highest score in this little tree shape state search space. Yeah. Won't it often not be the most likely uh, combination? Why would that be? Uh, well, for, okay, just the idea I was thinking of first was, uh, uh, say you said, how was she? She was fine. Uh -huh. um, most of the time, I'd imagine that would be asking about the condition of someone who was sick or injured. Mm -hmm. But it's entirely possible they're still talking, they're talking about um, she was attractive. Uh -huh. Okay, but that's not, that's, not a, that's not the grammar, right? Yeah. The grammar is the same in each of those cases. So uh, we don't really care about that here. So that issue of lexical ambiguity is uh, in some ways a separate thing. But I mean, it is true that you can say different things in different contexts that will cause you to analyze sentences in different ways, right? I mean, coming back to these things, there is some, some like story I could tell you that would cause us to analyze enraged cow enders farmer with ax uh, with the reading in which the cow is holding the ax. And so it might be the case that the, sing, you know, the single best derivation is not what you want. And so then what you can ask for instead is a distribution over all of the different derivations that you had of the sentence. Um, and it turns out there are compact ways of representing those distributions in the same way that kind of HMMs are compact representations of distributions over sequences. Um, but that's getting a little advanced. OK, so we have these parse tree things. Um, what do we do with them? What I want to talk about next uh, is one particular application that we can do 
uh, once we have tools for doing linguistic analysis like this, which turn out to be useful for tons of stuff downstream. So this is a project actually that I worked on uh, last year, and it's a question answering problem. Uh, sorry, some of these slide titles are uh, unhelpful. But basically we have a problem that's set up like this. Uh, I have a question, what color is the necktie? I have a photograph of a person or a statue or whatever, and we want to be able to map from this photograph and from this question to the answer to the question, which is yellow. Um, this is a vision task, and so as suggested by our whole neural nets uh, lecture yesterday, most of the time when we do vision nowadays, uh, we're doing vision with neural networks. But one of the things that makes this question answering task in particular a little different from other kinds of questions in vision is that you know, every question is asking you to perform a different kind of computation on the image, right? When we're doing image recognition, fundamentally we're looking at the pixels, we're trying to get a label out. When we're doing, uh, you know, sort of the drawing bounding boxes thing that we were looking at yesterday. Every image you get, you're trying to do the same to thing to it. You're trying to draw a bounding box around the object that you were trying to find. But with question answering, it's going to be a little different because with question answering, you know, kind of, we might be asked to do anything. We might be asked to count the number of things in the image. We might be asked to find the location of some object in the image. We might be asked to just say sort of what the image is. We might here wind up with some kind of complicated thing where I first have to find some object in the image and then report on some attribute of it. And we can ask more complicated things, right? If I have like uh, some little toy shaped world here, for example, and I ask, is there a red shape above the circle? Um, there's a bunch of different stuff that I have to do here, right? I have to figure out where the red things are. I have to figure out where the circles are. I have to figure out the spatial relations between them. So the amount of computation that we have to perform is going to change. And the kind of computation that we have to perform is going to change depending on the question that we were asked. And so the way we went about doing this um, is saying rather than building up some kind of monolithic neural network structure like we were looking at last class, every time we see a new question, we're essentially going to build up a neural network on the fly from scratch, from a bunch of little pieces. Um, uh, and the rules for putting together that neural network on the fly are going to come from a linguistic analysis of the question that we were asked. So we have something like this. If I have a question, is there a red shape above a circle? I can run my parser to get some kind of tree-shaped structure like this. And then I can turn that tree-shaped structure into a kind of template for putting together a full neural network out of little fragments of neural nets. Um, and we can, we can then use this to answer questions. So we, uh, yeah, here are some examples from the model. So here's the question, what color is she wearing? Um, you know, here's, here's the sort of simple linguistic analysis we get of this question. And the model correctly predicts that the color she is wearing is white. One thing we can do with models like this, uh, and I can talk more about how exactly this works if people are interested, is we can figure out what parts of the image they think they actually need to look at in order to answer to answer the question. And what we can see here, in fact, is that it has decided when it's looking for evidence of some kind of wearing event, that it's going to look at the woman's clothes. It's going to look in a little region above her head where maybe it might have seen a hat. Uh, and just by looking at those parts of the image, it's going to be able to tell that the color the woman is wearing uh, is white. And we can ask more complicated questions like, what is the thing that's in the sheep's ear? So we can kind of find the sheep. We can find the ear. Uh, you can see in the zoomed in image, the thing that's in the sheep's ear is a tag. And in fact, if we again look at sort of where the model has decided to focus its attention, it's put all of its attention on the ear of the sheep and it's correctly predicted that the label here is tag. Is that a question in the back? Yeah. Oh, well, so what, what we're seeing here, uh, yeah, why not both sheep's ears? Uh, I don't know, because it can see that there's one ear that has a thing in it and one ear that doesn't have a thing in it. Um, you know, it's neural networks, so kind of who knows. And doing these attention visualizations sometimes gives us a handle on what's going on, but not always, again, because if you remember yesterday, all we wound up with was some kind of big complicated bag of weights, and we don't always have great introspection into those. One of the other cool things that we can do with a model like this is, you know, we sort of motivated by neural nets, motivated neural nets by saying, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, we could stop doing sort of domain specific engineering for vision or domain specific engineering for text. And so we can bake, take basically the same model architecture and rather than showing it images and asking it to sort of answer questions about images, we can show it, again, without getting into detail, some representation of like a database of facts about US geography and we can ask it geography questions and use exactly the same machinery uh, in this case to, to do 
database questioning, question answering, geogra geographic question answering, uh, and things of this kind. So here's one example of something that you can do with a parser. It's an example of things that we can do with neural nets by uh, sort of plugging various pieces together in the way that we were looking at yesterday uh, and, and being able to do language and vision or language and other kinds of structured things all at the same time. Okay, so the next application that we're going to look at, and this is super cool. Oh, no, no, actually, before we move on from this, uh, I don't have uh, a live demo of my own thing, but I do have somewhere a live demo. Well, why is that all black? A live demo of somebody else's question system for the same task. This is not quite as good as mine, but probably uh, the difference is small enough that, that we won't be able to notice the difference here. So here's a picture. Which picture should I choose? The giraffe? Okay. So what question do we want to ask about this picture? How many giraffes? So we typed in how many giraffes, and it guesses two, which is very impressive because there are two giraffes. I'm going to tell you a dirty secret about this data set, which is that if two... Any, quest, any question that starts with how many, you answer two, you get most of the how many questions right, just because of the sort of particular set of images that wound up in this data set. So either two or three, uh, and, and you're going to be in pretty good shape. What other questions could we ask about this picture? Sorry, where was the photo taken? Okay. Uh, the prediction is no. When? Yeah, uh, this was like, uh, this is the, the MIT Facebook people, which came out like a month after our first thing. So it would have been like September-ish of last year. Yeah. Yeah, so they have a demo online, but I didn't have any photos on my computer that were suitable for upload. Yeah, so there are a couple of teams at Berkeley that have worked on this, and, uh, and they all work in similar ways. Uh, okay, let's ask, let's ask one more question, maybe about a different picture before we move on. Uh, how about this one? Okay, no. Um, how many sprinkles? I, yeah. I bet it's going to be two. It's one! <laughs> okay. Um, it's not all bad. You can actually, you know, I think the, this is meaningless without knowing what the distribution of questions look like, but the state of the art on this task is now in the kind of like mid sixties ish, um, percent of questions we can answer correctly, which is impressive when you think about the sort of total number of questions, uh, that could be asked. Uh, what is this? Okay. This is really bad. <laughs> This is much, bad, much, much worse than I expected it to be. Okay, uh, well, I will not tell Bole that we uh, didn't like his demo. Um, sorry. Sorry, somebody asks, is this food? Now I'm kind of curious. Is this food? Yes. <laughs> Turns out you should also answer most yes-no questions with yes, and you do pretty well. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm not optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a long way to go still on this task. And uh, you know, one of the things that we were really pushing on is getting this kind of compositionality into these models, which this is really... so. This model right here is just a kind of big dumb neural network that looks at a representation of the question, looks at a representation of the image, spits out an answer. Uh, it empirically seems to be very hard in these kinds of models to get this kind of linguistic compositionality where you have, uh, you know, you expect that putting no in front of a question should cause your answer to flip. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that our model in general seems to do a little bit better, but there's still plenty of room to work here. Yeah. This model is not doing any kind of semantic analysis on the sentence. It just kind of 
slurps up the sentence with a neural net and then does the same to the image. Um, so yeah, we're, our thing does a little bit more semantic analysis, but still, uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Some of the really early people working on this task did real kind of like hardcore semantic parsing with real like lambda calculus expressions coming out at the end. It just doesn't work all that well uh, because it's hard to hook that up to uh, the vision system if you have a purely symbolic representation of language. And so, uh, yeah, and that to me is the really interesting question because we really, you know, we know at some level we kind of need these symbolic representations of language or we benefit from them in other tasks and, and getting them to work in vision is is interesting. Okay. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to look at here is StarCraft. Who here has played StarCraft before? Who here has no idea what StarCraft is? Okay, so StarCraft is one of these real-time strategy games where basically you have, you know, you're in charge of some army of aliens and you're fighting against some other army of aliens. Um, but it has a bunch of different pieces because in order to successfully fight against the army of other aliens, uh, you have to, like, build up that army from scratch, starting with natural resources. So there's a whole bunch of different stuff that you have to do. You have to kind of work on managing those resources and basically having a little economy that you know how to organize. Uh, you have to know how to do research and what research to do. You have to know what to build, what order to build it in. And then finally, sort of having built all of your units, uh, how to most effectively deploy them and send them out in the world to, uh, uh, to win the game. And so what's really interesting about StarCraft relative to, you know, a lot of the other kinds of stuff that we've looked at in this class uh, is just that all of the things that we said make our reinforcement learning settings hard and our, hard and our probabilistic inference settings hard. Uh, and, and all of these things are there to a really extreme degree in StarCraft, right? Like all of these sort of two-player games we were looking at before, it's adversarial, like, uh, you know, chess and a lot of these other games, the horizon is really, really far out. And so we're not just going to be able to do uh, kind of normal... Uh, tree search, even with alpha beta pruning or whatever, uh, to figure out what I should do right now. Uh, it's partially observable because, you know, the map is hidden from you until you explore the parts of the map that, that, that you've been to. Um, and you're having to make decisions all the time, right? The, you know, if you have a frame rate of 24 frames per second or something, then in principle you need to be making a different decision about what to do every, you know, 24 times a second or something like that. In practice you can get away with less, but you still really can't afford to spend a lot of time thinking about what your next action is going to be because you have to decide now. Um, you're controlling many, many units at the same time, and so there's this combinatorial blow up in the size of the action space, so the branching factor is really huge because, you know, I have 10 units, I could select any subset of them, uh, and, and already we're in just like an exponential number of moves per turn to say nothing of, of the depth of the tree as we go deeper. Um, so all this really, you know, sort of complicated stuff. And the point here is that no single technique that we've developed in this class uh, is going to allow us to solve it kind of off the shelf. But we can, by putting all of these things together, uh, build an effective StarCraft agent. Yeah? I, one of the first things I ever did when I was in programming was make something I could win more than half the time. Against what? Against low-level human players. Okay. Um, that's very impressive. Um, <laughs> it's, it's simple enough. You just attach like really simple actions that they can repeat. Okay. Um, like, why is it harder for the uh, learning algorithms than for just repeating? Ooh, so what do you mean by a repeat algorithm? Okay. What it did, it made zergs until it got attacked, uh -huh. counterattacked, and then when it cleared out the minions, it pushed. Okay. That's all. Okay, so, you know, right, there is, I mean, I don't actually know very much about StarCraft at all, but um, <laughs> there are, uh, from the, I, you know, I had a friend who was like a commentator for Star StarCraft, collegiate StarCraft matches, uh, just in undergrad, um, so... It was a while ago. Nothing, nothing serious. But anyway, so I watched, you know, uh, a couple of these games. And what I was able to determine is basically it's a really complicated game of rock, paper, scissors in the sense that you kind of have to make intelligent guesses about uh, what your opponent's strategy is going to be before you really know what's going on. And then there's a lot of really complicated, like, micro-level control uh, once you're actually engaged in battle. So if you're really good, it's like rock, paper, scissors. And otherwise, uh, it's, it's, it's terrifyingly hard. So 
for any fixed strategy, right? There's some other strategy that's going to come in and be able to beat it. Uh, and so what we want is something that can adapt to the decisions that our opponents are making and the kinds of opponents that we're facing and all that. Uh, and, you know, in general, you're not going to be able to do that if you commit to a particular fixed strategy ahead of time. Um, so the context of all of this is back in 2010, uh, some people, this was before my time, but some people from my research group uh, decided to basically take a semester off of doing real, real AI research uh, and build a StarCraft bot instead. There was this big international StarCraft AI competition, uh, a bunch of different entrants from research labs, from universities, from, you know, kind of individuals sitting at home programming StarCraft bots uh, and all that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so the setup was basically the, it was discovered that in an early version of StarCraft you could, uh, why is this thing still on the screen? Sorry, I guess we're not going to be able to make that go away. Um, uh, well, but I can't quit, quit, I mean it is quick time, but I can't make it go away unless there's some way for me to move this throw this to a different screen, which there probably isn't. Okay, uh, we'll live with it. Uh. Anyway, uh, so a bunch, of, a bunch of these different teams, and you, know, you had some hook into uh, the StarCraft program that basically allowed you to send low-level commands, like take this unit, move it to this position, or cause it to attack at this position, or whatever. Um, and the system that the Berkeley produced was called the Berkeley Overmind. Uh, those of you who have played StarCraft before, guess which race was the preferred race of Berkeley? The Zerg, right? So this is, the, there's a, a Zerg character in this game called the Overmind. Uh, anyway, uh, and this, this Berkeley Overmind uh, that, that we built, uh, in fact, used a lot of these kind of core AI techniques that you've learned in this class. So there's a search component uh, that was used for figuring out how to get from point A to point B. There was a constraint satisfaction component for figuring out when you're building, you know, your base with all of the buildings that are able to produce new units, how do you orient themselves, those things relative to each other to kind of maximize the efficiency of that production process. Um, uh, minimax search for the sort of local problem of when, you know, my unit X is fighting against the other person's unit Y, uh, what's the most effective sequence of moves to, to do that. Uh, and that involved both a kind of minimax component and also a learning component where these things were just trained to kind of fight against each other until they developed uh, the best possible strategy. Uh, there's probabilistic inference and kind of HMM style stuff where you don't always get to see where the other person's units are, but you get maybe some kind of noisy signal about that. And so you're trying to do inference about what, what the state of their units, what the state of their base is, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So what I want to bring up now are just a couple of little uh, videos of, uh, of the Berkeley Overmind in action. Uh, sh showing off these various things, the kind of path planning piece of this and the uh, CSP piece and, and all that. So, uh, oh man, this one has really good music that goes along with it. So I would really like for us to be able to use the real video. Let's see if this works. So this little purple thing is our unit. It's trying to get somewhere. So all it was trying to do was to get from the like bottom of that little cluster of rocks at the beginning to the top. But there were other bad guys in the way. And so it was having to continuously replan on the fly what's the shortest path from point A to point B, subject to the constraint that I don't get killed uh, along the way. And so this is a thing that you can do if you have really fast algorithms for doing search. Um, and what do we have next? Uh, the next thing we have is figuring out how to do uh, targeting. And I should be able to bring this up. Um, In this clip, the mean list start out by circling the enemy's base looking for a good opening. Uh, here they found them in the corner of the base uh, where they swoop down the enemy's kill the turret and then start using out the worker mines. Then, of course, the enemy rushes into the lines to defend, so the mean list fire off as many shots as they can and then try to retreat from the safest route uh, in the bottom of the base. 
They take a few more shots and then run off to fight the undefended barracks that the enemy tried to hide in the corner of the map. Right, so we're using uh, Minimax search, just like we learned in this class, to figure out what the right move is going to be that's going to kind of keep me safe from, uh, from the other people and still do as much damage as I'm trying to do. Yeah? How did it do against you players? Um, apparently, so uh, the high level strategy, it turned out there was another uh, researcher in the AI thing at Berkeley uh, who was also like a highly ranked Spanish StarCraft player. Uh, so he designed the high level strategy and then the low level strategy was this. Apparently it was not good enough to beat, uh, like, you know, come even close to beating pro players, but all of, like most of the amateurs in the research group who were actually building it were not able to beat it by the end. Um, yes, yeah, so that's a thing we can do with Minimax search. Another thing that we can do uh, and apparently this like hit and run thing is super annoying as a human player uh, because it requires really fast reflexes to defend against and most people don't have that. Um, we also have learning. So this hit and run thing we were seeing uh, in the previous video uh, is actually really terrible if all of your units are clustered right together and you happen to get hit uh, to face an enemy of the wrong kind that can do this blue lightning thing that's a kind of area of effect and, and kills everyone all at once. And so you want to learn a different strategy. Different strategy for defending against that because we just got totally destroyed, which is no good. Um, but so what, it, what they did is they just set up this little thing where kind of, you know, we would learn a policy for unit A and we would learn a policy for unit B and then we would update them and they would fight endlessly against each other, uh, trying to do as well as possible. And what you wind up with here at the end uh, is that they learn when they see this particular kind of unit to scatter. So this business of learning from self-play, for those of you who saw the Google uh, Go playing AI, basically the same principle that we're deploying here, that you can use self-play to, to build things that are then able to go out and compete well against humans. Um, I think those are all the interesting videos, so let's not show any more videos. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, how did we... Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, how did we do in this StarCraft competition? Well, a bunch of different teams start out. I can't remember how many it was. Uh, there was a big bracket. Final round was us versus uh, something called Crassio, and we beat it uh, uh, hands down and won the competition. And so this was, for a very brief time, uh, the very best StarCraft bot in the world that had entered in the competition. Um, and, uh, and now I think the state of the art has moved on conservatively. They've, so the contest organizers, I think, we're expecting themselves to win, and we're really upset when uh, when Berkeley won the contest instead. Uh, we have not participated again since then. Um, uh, okay, questions about StarCraft game playing generally before we move on. Uh, yeah. Machine learning. Yeah, yeah. So this. Uh, um, uh, where was it? This thing right here, this was learned, right? So initially they're going to start out, you know, we're learning a policy for the guys with the blue lightning and the guys with the big red wings. Uh, and initially they're both terrible policies, but you, via reinforcement learning, right, can figure out which attack worked, which attack didn't work. And so if you just do this kind of self-play over and over again, eventually you're going to, you know, you hope that you're going to converge to a strategy where both of these things are better than they started out. And in particular, if there's some, uh, sort of obvious weakness uh, like this being all bunched up together, you learn just by exploring sufficiently that it's better to scatter apart. Yeah. And so this is an example of kind of using machine learning basically as a proxy for uh, doing some really expensive minimax search procedure or whatever, right? In principle, you could figure out via minimax that you should scatter right away because if you don't, you're going to die. But it's just not a search that you can kind of 
feasibly do for this many units this fast. And so uh, you just try a bunch of things out and you, and you learn that this is the right way to behave instead. Yeah. Um, I want to say it was like, uh, oh, stop it. Um, Tenish people for six months or longer, but I'm I'm not actually positive about that. There was a they ran a little like seminar class, uh, and a bunch of people all worked on this at the same time. But the core group were uh, probably like three or four PhD students, and then some other people who were helping out on the side. So if people are yeah. Uh, they did not use that because nobody knew how to use neural networks back in, in 2010, so long ago. Um, this is a very natural thing to look at next. There are actually, I've seen a couple uh, papers already on learning policies represented as neural nets that, that play StarCraft games like this. Um, but they're still doing much simpler things. They're doing at the level of kind of like microcontrol rather than high level game strategies. Um, Video games generally is something that people talk a lot right now as being the kind of next big frontier in uh, in learning policies for AI. Now that you know Go is like the last hard board game, and now that we've beaten Go, uh, I guess StarCraft and Grand Theft Auto are are the two next things. Seriously, um, the, and so there are like serious research labs that are that are working on StarCraft and Grand Theft Auto Minecraft. and Minecraft. Minecraft is interesting because there's it's open ended. Um, but there was a really there was a really cool paper from Microsoft on doing you know we've talked about local search procedures as doing kind of hill climbing, uh, so they had a literal hill climbing for Minecraft where it learns to go from the like input to the player's camera uh, to figure out what way to point and walk so that it eventually reaches the top of a hill, uh, which is kind of a clever thing. Any more questions about this game stuff? Okay, um, stop it, stop it, stop it. Uh, so the last thing that I want to talk about today, uh, and we may be done a little early, in which case uh, I will like open things up for, for questions from everyone here. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk about autonomous driving. Um, so these slides, this has actually come quite far in the last couple of years, and, and these slides may be a little old. But again, way back in 2005, there was the first of these DARPA grand challenges, uh, where the, the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, put out an open call saying, we're going to run this contest where you have to drive from uh, uh, some, some very long distance that's shown on the map here. Uh, yeah, 100, 150 mile off-road robot race in the desert. Various hazards, no driver in the car, no remote control, nothing. Uh, everything has to be automated in the car. And this was back in 2005. Um, and uh, uh, I guess they had, uh, sorry. So they had in fact run the contest the year before in 2004. Uh, and no car got more than like eight miles past the start. And then they all crashed. Um, and uh, what's really impressive is by 2005, things had come quite a long way. So I think this is a video, if it's a video at all, which it might not be. Um, the first time it's ever been done, autonomous vehicles. As dawn breaks over the desert, robots prepare to boldly go where no robot has ever gone before. And we have movement from Stanley, ladies and gentlemen, the start of the DARPA Grand Challenge. After months of tireless effort, there's a lot at stake. And now Sandstorm. A vision they all share will now be put to the test. Each one leaves the shoot with confidence. A far cry from the first grand challenge where many faltered in sight and start, and no robot went beyond seven miles. During the first eight miles of the race, Highlander gains two minutes on Stanley.
behind Stanley Sandstorm is closing the gap and may pass the Stanford Roma. They must wind through a treacherous mountain pass and stand. Yeah, so, you know, this was back in 2005 when this was a really big deal. Not that many people were doing it, right? It was basically like Stanford. There were a couple of teams from Carnegie Mellon, a couple of people from industry. Um, uh, and now everyone's talking about self-driving cars, right? You go down to the South Bay, you see the little Google self-driving cars out on the road all the time. Um, Tesla's talking about building a self-driving car. Uber's talking about building a self-driving car. You know, like GM is talking about building a self-driving car. So... Uh, this technology has really come quite a long way in the last couple of years and, and is probably something that we're going to see soon. Um, but uh, there are still issues, uh, some of which are kind of fun to look at, so let's just do that. Um, one of the things you'll notice here is that a lot of these have these like spinning laser rangefinder things on top of the cars. Uh, we're going to talk about this more in a minute, but you know, being able to look sort of at great distances and, and have a sense of distance and depth turns out to be really important. One of the teams who was in uh, either this challenge or the 2004 challenge um, didn't actually do all that well in the competition, but they put all of this effort into developing a really good laser rangefinder. And by the next year, everyone else, they, they were no longer entering in the contest. They had just turned into a car that builds laser, or a, a company that builds laser rangefinders, and everyone else was buying uh, their hardware instead. So they got richest off of the DARPA Grand Challenge because because they built the hardware that everyone wanted. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this was the Berkeley entry. <laughs> so not so bad, but not winning anything. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Okay, and so on. Um, navigation, it turns out, is, is hard, and building a self-driving car is hard. So one of the things that's actually been really critical to the success of these uh, is just developing better sensor technology and equipping these things with, in fact, way more sensor information than, for, for example, human drivers ever have, right? So they have uh, GPS, they have compass, they have tons of computers on board, they have these scanning lasers on top which give you some kind of range finding information, they have cameras all over which give you different kind of visual information about the scene around you, people are starting to put sonar on these as well, so you have tons and tons of information in a kind of 360 degree view um, of what's going on around the car, but ultimately, you know, kind of all you're doing is learning some kind of control policy that looks like the control policies that we've been talking about in this class, right? You get some kind of observation of the world from your cameras and from your various other sensors, and what you have to produce uh, is some kind of angle for your steering wheel. And maybe, you know, you have some target trajectory that you're trying to follow that's been given to you on a map, and so the control problem is basically figuring out when I deviate from, from this target trajectory, how do I get back onto it when I'm on it? How do I avoid falling off? Uh, and then, you know, maybe if it's wrong, how do I avoid accidentally driving off a cliff or into another car uh, or something. Um, one of the cool things that you can do with that uh, is you can actually use this combination of the laser and the camera to do some amount of supervision. So the laser data is uh, more reliable, right? It gives you depth and not just kind of visual information, but um, it's comparatively short range uh, because these, you know, the, the sort of sensor reading that you get from the laser gets fuzzier the further out you point it, so they generally point it in a kind of relatively small circle around the car. Um, and so one of the problems here is that you have this really, you know, kind of inherently noisy laser information and you have to figure out uh, how to actually reconstruct what the world around you looks like. Um, how are we going to do this? Getting a noisy signal of the world, things are changing in time. Hidden Markov model, right? So you write down a hidden Markov model that looks like this. It's actually a hidden Markov model that looks like this, right, where you kind of know what control signal you're putting into the car, and that also influences the current state. You get a bunch of noisy sensor readings over time, but you know that you're not moving that much, and you know exactly in what way you're moving, and so you're able to sort of synthesize all of the sensor information as time goes by, uh, and so you can go from sort of a 12.6 uh, false positive rate where you're sort of seeing things where things are not actually to uh, basically zero false positive rate just by doing this kind of HMM inference uh, and integrating information over time from your noisy, noisy sensors. Uh, yeah, so, and then the other thing we were doing is we, we can do, as we were saying before, uh, is to combine information from multiple sensor types. So the camera gets to see much further away, but it doesn't actually give you depth information. Uh, so you want, yeah, I don't know why that picture is there. Um, so this is what, what the kind of vision problem for the car looks like. Um, but we can overlay on top of this, and this is the key, information from the laser that actually tells you what the ground looks like underneath and whether there are obstacles in the way, uh, and so on and so forth. And so you can use basically laser information from the future to supervise camera information from the past. So if I'm learning a model to reconstruct what the ground looks like just based on the camera input, I can do that by driving the car around, running both the camera and the laser scanner, and then kind of using laser information from time t and camera information from time t minus something, uh, and basically try to use the camera to predict what the laser is going to tell me once I get close to this, close enough to this thing that I'm looking at. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in what sense that it can't like see through? Can't see through the wall and can't see around the car. Uh, I mean, at some point there are physical limitations, right? We don't have sensors really that can see through walls and figure out what the ground looks like on the other side. Uh, so to the extent that people are basically able to survive in these conditions, uh, cars should too. Right. So yeah, I mean, we you know this is not magic, but it does get to see a little more than people get to see. And, and so the key trick here turns out to be 
doing this kind of self-supervision, and that then allows you to project your depth, depth information uh, way forward into space. Um, and note that in order to do this, right, you have to have a pretty good model of how the car is moving, which is going to come from you, come from your own uh, information about what signals you're sending to the wheels, and maybe from the GPS information also, because, uh, sorry, to jump to where we were, the laser information that I'm using to predict what's happening out here, I'm only going to see when it's up close right here. And so you need to be able to kind of integrate those two models uh, with the motion of the vehicle. Uh, and so this is this kind of self-supervised vision trick. Um, so one thing that's happened is that these self-driving cars are now really pretty good uh, at basically functioning totally on their own in uh, these kind of wild environments like the desert where, you know, the scary thing is not being able to see around corners on uh, windy passes because the road doesn't move, the walls don't move. The really scary thing is being in some kind of urban environment where people move uh, and objects move from time to time and so you can't kind of pre-record things ahead of time. Um, and so here the vision problem becomes even more important and more interesting because you have to do a lot of tracking of what are the objects in the scene, where are the other cars, how do I think they're going to move, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, yeah, here's, here's another thing using LiDAR, um, and, uh, and we have a bunch of different videos like this. So, yeah, and the key thing here is that basically, you know, the same kind of inference that you were doing uh, for this Ghostbusters problem where you don't get to see the boat ghosts, but you get some kind of noisy signal about where they are. The car doesn't get to see the people, but it's getting some kind of noisy signal about where they are, and it has to, has to be able to do the inference uh, through that noise and its sensors in order to avoid uh, running over people, which would be very bad PR. Um, yeah, and so you may have seen these things driving around. I don't know why this screen... Uh, Anyway, that's all we have prepared for today. If people want to stick around for like five or ten minutes uh, and just like ask questions about AI in general, that might be a good use of time. Uh, and otherwise, uh, I guess you're free to leave. Yes, Davis. Oh, yeah, we do have a StarCraft Live demo. Thank you. Do people want to see a StarCraft Live demo or have you had too much StarCraft already? Okay, cool. Um, I hope this works. So this code is still around. If people are interested in working on it, uh, talk to me, because there are things we could do. Good call. Uh, 